Okay, first you find this helper function. This is just to kind of have a nice plot of scatter plots with histograms on the on the axis that you saw in the slides. And kind of uh, the basic package is a library copula, quite obvious, I say. And um, the library copula is pretty much object based uh, implemented. So kind of every copula family um, is kind of a different object class. So kind of for every copula family, you have a own class. And here, for instance, the Gumbel copula. So this is always the constructors uh, of this class is always shaped the same way. So we have a Gumbel copula, and for the Gaussian one, it's normal copula. And then there's a frame copula, for instance, and many, many more. And um, if you don't provide any other parameters, they by default bivariate, so two dimensions. And you can provide a parameter. And the, unfortunately, the ranges of the parameters are very different based on the copula family. But uh, there's a nice result that Kendall's tau is very closely related to copulas. And with this Kendall's tau, you can parameterize all copula families in the same way but just getting started. Um, you just take a Gumbel copula, construct one instant of this class, and if you know, kind of call the object cop gump for copula Gumbel, uh, we got a small description down here in the console. That's a Gumbi copula family. It's an Archimedean copula. Uh, Archimedean copulas is a larger class that can combine several families that have similar construction principles. And it's an extreme value copula um, meaning that it has upper tail dependence. Um, so kind of, if you have two extreme events that go very far into the tail, into the top right corner of this copula, then you still have a uh, stronger dependence. And kind of, just as you have in R, uh, this typical aberrations are D, P and Q for um, different distributions. So you have R uniform for sampling from a uniform distribution, D, for, D uniform to get the density, uh, P uniform to get the correlated density, and Q to kind of derive a quantiles. Uh, you get the same for the copulas. So you have R copula to get a random sample from a copula. You've got D copula to get the density of a copula, and P copula to get the cumulative distribution function. Unfortunately, you don't have a Q copula because this was kind of, um, then you would provide a quantile, but the result kind of is complete line in two dimensions and it's a surface in three dimensions. So it doesn't really make sense to implement Q copula as it is. <coughs> so for our copula, you could kind of ask for 500 points. Um, shaped as the Gumbel copula that we initiated earlier up here. And so we just have a sample. And with a small helper function defined in the first 20 lines, we then kind of get a nice scatter plot of the copula and surround it by the marginal distributions. And kind of whenever I redo it, it looks slightly different because every time I get a new sample, but kind of what all samples have in common is this common structure of being very close up here and a little bit more spread down here so that you don't have a symmetry uh, in the lower left and top right corner. And we can do the same for the... Uh, okay, now here we uh, kind of transform the marginals. So what I'm kind of showing now is starting with the copulas, adding margins, getting to the distribution. What you would do in a kind of applied example that we can do in a couple of, uh, of minutes, that you kind of have a distribution, a sample of, of something, and then would like to fit a copula to it, try to find out what's best fitting one. So here really just kind of we use the Q norm function as the inverse of the cumulative distribution function to get from the scale zero run back to the scale of the normal distribution. And if we provide mean value, then kind of the mean of these distributions is shifted to four. 
So this is kind of just the usual parameters um, of the normal distribution. Yeah. Um, I don't know why it is that answers to me very well. I mean. Yeah. Um, I think that you are missing here the, the model of relationship between distance and cor and the correlation and the covariance among dots, among pairs of values. Um, I'm kind of plotting the full sample and instead of just calculating the correlation value of the sample, I would like to find a way to describe all of the points. I'll try to make it easier for plotting. What would be a long name for each of the, of the axes here? A long name? Like an a long name would be like uh, well, body weight and body length. So it's really what you observe from it. This is the original value. Yeah, yeah. But, but then you're gonna... Uh, then I scale it to zero one, and then it's not the original values anymore, then it's more or less um, the probabilities. The probabilities of being in a, in a, in a given kind, class? Kind of the, well, probably it's the, the uh, not a given class. Um, let me raise it where I have the... Yes. Um, it kind of says, you, you can read these as kind of quantiles or percentiles, so that you kind of look, if you look at the v value 0 0.95, which is kind of the 95 percentile, mm -hmm. uh, then you kind of get kind of a section uh, through here, and you will get a distribution of the quantiles of the y-axis that occur together with this quantile. That's, for instance, a way you could look at. And so... What you have here is, is a, a quantile of shift versus a quantile of, it, of y. Yeah. Just that? Yeah. That's not related to distance? No, not yet. You get different plots for different distances. Okay, good. Uh, they're entering when you start to combine copulas for different distances. So like you have for the Viagram, you have different Viagram values for different distances, and here you have different copulas for different distances. It's, uh, yeah. uh, let me see... It might be helpful to do it the other way around. That's why I'm currently looking for a nice example. Um, triples. Oh, simulated triples. So this is now an... Uh, ideological example where you kind of have at one single measurement sh station, so this not yet spatially, uh, observe three different vowels, peak, duration, and volume. And we'd like to know how do they kind of connect to each other? How, how do they really look like? And kind of therefore, um, kind of we use this catalyst function from before to look at the first and second column. And we could look at the first and third one.
and the second and third. So these are all three possible combinations. So I get an idea of the marginal distributions that are very skewed. These are annual maxima from a simulated time series of almost 500 years. And um, so I get very skewed distributions of these maxima. And then would like to understand how is their, is their uh, relationship like. So we need to somehow rank transform them. Or kind of, this is kind of part of dropping the margins. You could either use the CDF if you have a marginal distribution function. If you don't have a CDF, you can calculate the rank of each, some R candy here, apply triples to This wasn't useful. Um, so doing this ring transform here, or kind of, um, let me explain this one line here. Um, apply takes this metrics-like object triples. So we have three columns and 500 rows. And we apply a function to the columns, so column-wise, and for every column, we kind of put it into this function, which calculates the rank, so just some of the, the ordering of the values, divided by the number of all samples plus one. And uh, if we now look at these, we see we have uniform distributed marginal distributions. So this um, rank transformation is kind of the empirically estimated cumulative distribution function uh, that we would like to estimate still. But to get a first idea to do a fast example, these are very good estimators. And here's now the dependence structure between row one and three, and here between two and three. So we can have seen completely different pictures, and this one is especially interesting because you have, it seems to be like you have a crisp boundary here, and just kind of, it looks bounded, but still there's some, some points go beyond this point. And kind of, these are harder to describe. And then you can start to try to fit copulas to uh, your data set. So we now look at the, the plot here, the combination two, three. And could, for instance, fit a BB6 copula. That's one of the families. And get an estimate. We could just try. The normal case. And as when we get a, uh, the maximized log likelihood value, which is 216 for the normal case and 204 for the BB6 copula, so the normal one would be a better choice here. And there's as well
in the package wine copier, a nice tool, a nice function that iterates over all different families. So you don't have to try Gumbel, normal, BB6, BB7, BB1, the long list. You can simply kind of let the function do the job. And we just say, well, there are our triples, second column, third column, and wait for a moment, and you get a family. And here it says it's family number nine. And the help file tells us family nine is BB7. So we should get the same parameters if we do fit copula BB7 copula of RT triples second and third column. And now we have a log likelihood of 232 almost, which is clearly, at least clearly larger than the log likelihoods we had earlier. Two and three are kind of the correlation between uh, duration of a storm event and the volume of the storm event, which is kind of correlated in the sense that if the storm continues for a longer time, there's more time to generate more volume. So the longer it lasts, the higher the volume will be. But as the plots show here, there's still some uh, spread around, and the spread isn't completely symmetric. So we save this copula fit to new copula as our kind of favorite fit. And could now kind of look at the structure a bit more nicely than just on the scatter plot. Uh, we say persp, this is short for perspective plot fit, and say, well, we would like to look at the density. And here we get the density, which is kind of Oh, here. <coughs> Which is hard to read on its own, but once one has seen a couple of copulas, you kind of get an idea of what, what these look like and what kind of shapes uh, denote what kind of dependencies. And if we take our fitted copula and say, well, let's assume our duration is like on the 95 percentile. Um, and you would like to get the 95 percentile. Yeah, then this is only possible if we kind of add the 100% percentile of the border. But if you like 93 and look into 79.5 mm, percentile, you kind of get a pair of points. This is now the... Um, and what you look at now, we now have the bivariate distribution, how duration and volume depend on each other. And we could now ask, well, given we have a certain duration, and the duration is kind of at the percentile of 79.5 of all the range of values, so kind of very extreme duration, a very long storm, um, what would be the 
what would be the value of the volume at 93%. And you can kind of, you can get a complete conditional distribution now. So given a certain duration, you can plot the density curve of the volume and kind of explain how the volume might behave for this given uh, value of duration. So that's kind of one possibility to then exploit the Coppola to, to model something, to kind of say something about risk. Uh, what's the value we have to expect given this other value? Or you can kind of use it to sample from it, from the Coppola fit. So this is a sampled version, and this is kind of the version we try to fit. Uh, where here's, here we see some kind of linear structures, which means these values are so small that there, are, there aren't any uh, kind of, we only have the durations to kind of uh, certain, I think it's just one digit uh, kind of behind the, the dot. And so we get some, uh, Kind of discontinuity there because the kind of resolution of the measurement isn't fine enough to really mimic a continuous spread here. That's why we get this uh, stripe-like shapes here. It's, it's not the process. It's not part of the process. It's part of the measurements that have been taken, and you don't get this for the sample, of course, because the sample is completely assumed to be continuous. And you can kind of see many different versions of it. And now it's very easy to kind of simulate based on these 500 samples that we use for the training. You can easily simulate another 500,000, 10,000 uh, of these maximum annual, annual maximum values. So you don't have to run a full simulation study. You don't have a rainfall generator. generator. You can, if you trust in your 500 samples and you trust in your copulas, then you can kind of run more, generate more samples simply from the distribution instead from a full process of runoff model, rainfall generator, and so on. So really kind of have all the probabilistic tools now. So this is just kind of bivariate. And one. And if you would like to model the three dimensions in one step, not only the bivariate, as just shown for the second and third column, uh, there's the function rwine copula select that kind of selects an rwine copula for us based on the data set. Uh, it's a bit hard to read what it really does down here, but uh, it kind of says that between the pairs, um, two and three, well, let's try the other one. It uses the pairs one and two and one and three. So the first with the second and the first with the third column. And the first with the second is assumed to be family number nine. And nine was the BB7 copula, just as we identified. And it uses the correlation between one and three. 
and says, well, this is copula family number seven, which is to be one copula, and the copula between variables two and three, given one, selects copula family number one, so a Gaussian copula. So we kind of get three bivariate copulas that can be built up together again into a three-dimensional copula. And this three-dimensional copula can then be again used to model from it. Um, let's call it wine fit. So sampling from the wine copula uh, generates, if we look at simply head of new sample, uh, generates three variables at the same time. They are all random samples, uh, independent from each other, um, and all following this distribution as we just fitted. So can we now can sim sample three-dimensional uh, annual maximum events here. <clears throat> and then okay, for this 500, look at the scatter hist for different pairs again. The only problem here is that the wine copula package doesn't have any copula that is able to describe this uh, boundary effect. So kind of the boundary effect that we would like to be able to model uh, is not, I think it's one in three. Here, yeah. The uh, wine copula package doesn't have any copula implemented that is able to describe these dependencies here. So that's why it kind of guess, tries to fit the closest one, but the closest one then is still kind of symmetric and has a spread in both directions. So it just kind of it's still the problem if you don't have a family that is able to describe what you're seeing in the scatter plot. Uh, you might need to implement one, you might need to find one, you might need to find yet another transformation to be able to describe the process. Um, talk, talk like. You see that this, uh, the Torn family is a family that can describe boundaries and asymmetries, uh, asymmetric behavior. Um, I kind of see there seems to be a boundary up here, but long spread down here, for instance. So if you kind of get the correct rotated version of it, then we might be able to get this, this feature of this boundary effect. And you see here in the copula take, you get a value Kendall's tau, which is kind of the uh, copula related dependence, dependence measure. It's just the rank correlation between uh, two random variables. And you get the output of the lower and upper tail dependence. That is kind of how strongly are values dependent when both values go to zero or both values go to one. So if you kind of move into the tails of your bivariate distribution, how strong is the dependence? And here it is that the upper tail dependence is zero, which you can see as well as there's no, no spike in the upper right corner anymore. And the, upper, the lower tail dependence is pretty strong, what you can see as well by this kind of strong spike coming up uh, to the very front. 
And if you would kind of use a Gaussian copula, uh, even if you would go for perfect dependence, which is not the Gaussian copula anymore, if you go to very strong dependence here, uh, then you have a lower and upper tail dependence of zero. So the Gaussian copula is not able to model any tail dependence. So it's always if both variables tend into the corners, uh, the Gaussian copula tells us, well, they're independent. And this typically is not the case in what we, how we perceive the world. So this is kind of a drawback of the Gaussian copula. And in the R package, SP copula, you'll find a few demos. Um, how to fit a spatial wine copula or a spatial temporal covariate wine copula. That's kind of the most recent development. Um, we have a spatial temporal copula and a covariate that goes into the tree. And, um, well, a few a nice example on tail dependencies. This is the plot I wanted to show you. Um, it's based on the same data set, and kind of the black line is the calculation of the empirical tail dependence. It's kind of if you, to the left, it's the lower tail dependence, to the right, it's the upper tail dependence. And kind of what this black line indicates that if you go to the left, there isn't any tail dependence, so it kind of drops down to zero here. And if you go to the right, uh, kind of converges to a certain volume. So you would assume there is some tail dependence in this data set. So you would need to find a copula that can describe this tail dependence. And kind of the BB6 copula seems to do the best job here, kind of being very close to the black line up here, and as well following the rather sudden, uh, the rather continuous decrease uh, to zero here. While well, the blue line might do as well, the Gumbel copula, which is kind of a typical extreme value copula, but the green line, the Gaussian copula, uh, fails for the upper tail and is far off the black line from the lower tail. So the red curve here seems to be the best choice to describe at least a sample in terms of tail dependence. So you can not only optimize your copulas based on the log likelihood, but you could as well look into uh, tail dependence parameters and symmetry uh, properties that you would like to model and that you would like to avoid uh, in your data set based on your knowledge about the process, about the experience, your experience. Questions? Was it somewhat helpful to get copulas yet a bit more clearer? Yeah. Yeah, I can always just suggest then to kind of look into uh, demos that come with R packages. They often give a pretty good idea how it should work. Um, unfortunately, there are always still some packages that don't have any demo, but I believe the copy package does. quite a few. Uh, so that's something to look at if you want to kind of further explore it. Um, yeah. And you might find a vignette online on Cran that kind of describes a bit more detail because kind of the demos are R code that run, but they, they typically don't come with a lot of explanation. So 
you still have to work through the demo code your own and, and try to make sense out of the R statements that you see. But sometimes a bit more of explanation might be helpful to kind of get the picture uh, a bit more easily. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>